some trust in chariots. We trust in the name of the Lord, our God.
voice, oh my soul, oh my soul, what wondrous love is this, oh my soul, what wondrous love is this that caused the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse for my soul? for my soul to bear the dreadful curse for my soul To God and to the Lamb I will sing, I will sing. To God and to the Lamb I will sing. To God and to the Lamb who is the great I am. While millions join the theme I will sing. Happy Sunday, everyone. Uh, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. As we now 
uh, enter into this time of worship, I want to invite you now to join me in a word of prayer. Uh, but before that word of prayer, let's just take a minute or so to just ready our hearts to give worship to our God. So if you would join me just within this time of preparation. to go before you now as your people, as your son and daughter, and to be able to sing to you. Thank you so much, Father, for this moment of grace. We ask that, God, as we would go before you, open our eyes and open our hearts. Help us to see who it is that we get to sing to, who it is that receives us and calls us his own. And may that wonderful reality truth be the reason for our song today. Holy Spirit, dwell in the hearts of your people. Help us to worship you and in truth and in spirit. Restore us of the joy of worshiping you. And may that be, Lord, our melody to you today. All of this is for you. Lord, be glorified. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you join me in a song of worship? Come thou fount of every blessing To my heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Calls for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious song For thy course of 
Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it, seal it for thy course of love. Here's my heart. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it, seal it for thy course of love. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. Are here, you are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship.
Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 Lord Jesus, you are the way maker. When we feel lost in our way, when we feel like there is no hope, no going forward, you are the God. Who shows us the way. You are the God who illuminates the, the way that we need to walk. And you have become for us, Lord, the narrow path to salvation and life. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would continue to just convict our hearts of that amazing truth that with you we are found in hope. That as long as we have you, we are well. There is no room for fear because for us is the God Almighty, the King of Heaven, the Good Shepherd who cares for us deeply. As we continue to worship you, to wrestle with the Word, uh, to look to you as we go throughout the week, just remind us of all that you are. And may that be, Lord, our anchor, our rock stronghold and help us Lord to live boldly and courageously for you be with us now as we go into the word we ask that you would open our eyes open our hearts and allow the word to take root into our very very essence oh Lord we thank you again for everything that you do everything that you are we pray all these things in Jesus name amen Please join us now for a time of offering. Let's give to the Lord with true gratefulness and thankfulness in our hearts. So if you would join me in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much. We thank you for your abundant love, your amazing grace, your immeasurable kindness, and your compassion that has no end. It is by your generosity, it is by your providence that we have all the blessings in our lives and that we're able to give to you today. So, Father, as we count our blessings and as we enjoy the gifts that you have allowed in our lives, help us to give due credit to your name, to never take credit for uh, what is not ours, but rather to be the faithful steward that you have called us to be. Uh, for us to take our blessings and to use them in a way that brings you glory and joy. Will you teach us that kind of heart and will you allow that to be our expression of worship to you? Father, we're reminded of the, the widow and the two copper coins. We realize in order for us to live that kind of rich life, we do not need to have much. But it's about who we get to give to. So Father, tune our hearts so that we may give to you. Tune our hearts so that our lives may be dedicated to you. To have worth greater than what we own. 
Lord, allow us to live that kind of life that is filled with riches. Uh, be with your church. Help us to continue to honor you in, uh, in the role and the ways that we, are, uh, we have been positioned to do. And uh, may LAOC and all the brethren uh, within just be who you have called us to be. Thank you so much once again for this opportunity to give to you. All glory and praise to your most holy name. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. A few announcements before we go into our, uh, into our word. First announcement is regarding our offering. As always, there are three ways of giving. Uh, we want to continue to encourage you to participate and continue to um, take part in building up your church. Uh, the three ways are listed on to my right, and so utilize these tools to give to the Lord your offerings. Uh, the second uh, announcement pertains to our English ministry. We have our book sharing is starting up this week on uh, The Quarter Life Calling. It's a great book. And so for those of you who have registered, uh, looking forward to spending that uh, the next season with you as we discuss and engage in the dialogue here. Uh, for those who didn't get to participate this turnaround, uh, stay tuned. We'll have different ministry opportunities uh, down the road. And so hopefully you can join us for the next one. Keep these guys in prayer as they have uh, registered. May uh, God's blessing fill their life. Uh, the third announcement pertains to our Power Wave ministry. We have uh, continuing on our Friday nights, discipleship classes. Um, continue to, I want to encourage the uh, Power Wave students to continue to hold fast and to stay committed. Uh, I'm sure a lot of us are feeling Zoom fatigue. You know, with st school starting up, there's a lot of things online, and I'm sure we grow weary. Uh, but spending that time together with your church to be reminded of God's word and, and God's goodness, uh, there is none like it. So I want to encourage everyone to continue to participate in this uh, portion of church. Um, that's it as far as announcements go. Please join us now as we look to the word of God. Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Acts, chapter 9, verses 1 through 19. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem, and he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. S Saul spent several days with dis the disciples in Damascus. This is God's word. Amen. A wise philosopher once said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. 
this philosopher, his name was Mike Tyson, right? The, the heavyweight champion of the world in, in boxing, right? He said this before one of his biggest match against Evander Holyfield. Right? And this is what he said, right, in the interview. You know, the interviewer asked, do you have a plan? Or what's your plan for the match? And he said, well, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. And Mr. Mike Tyson, Mr. Philosopher, is absolutely correct. It's very natural for us to make plans as human, you know, but all our plans start to fall apart when we get hit in the face, when we get punched in the face. Now, I remember I, I took boxing lessons once with my friend in high school, and, you know, we were just learning the, the basics, you know, jab, jab, pow, pow. And after the class, he wanted to spar with me. And I'm like, sure, why not? Right? I'm a young team with a lot of you know, testosterone. I'm bigger. Right? I might be slightly stronger. I know I'm lengthier. You know? And I played a bunch of fighting games like Super Smash and you know, Street Fighter and Tekken. So I, I should know how to box. Right? I just took this class. I know the basics. So we stepped into the ring. And we began, we began dancing a little bit. Right? We began dancing around the ring. And I started to calculate my first move. Right? I started to plan my first move. And I started thinking back in all my fighting experiences with my brother, and I realized I can't do that here. That's illegal, right? No kicking, right? No scratching. Can't do that. You know? And I started thinking about all the games that I played and all the movies I watched, like Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan. Well, that's not realistic, right? I don't float like a butterfly seen like a bee. I'm not Muhammad Ali. So I come up with a plan, a very simple plan, a plan that is the most genius plan ever. Right? And the plan was, I'm going to step forward and do a one-two combo, right? Pow, pow. Just like that, right? Just like I learned in class. Pow, pow. One-two combo. And, you know, education has failed me in math, but not in boxing. Never until now, right? So I was confidently, and I, you know, I was confident enough to do this. So I took a step forward, you know, and the next thing I know, I hear a loud thud noise, right? And I'm blind. I, I suddenly can't see, and I got punched in the eye by one of my closest friends, and I'm freaking out. And suddenly, all my plans of one-two combo, right, has crumbled like like a sand castle on a beach. You know, and I don't know what to do. And I do what I do best when I'm losing in a fighting game. I start button mashing in real life, right? So what I do, I do one of these, right? I I pull back and I start punching like this, right, like this, ah, right. I start freaking out and I start punching him like this, you know, but I didn't land anything. I was just punching the air like this, right? Just punching the air, closing my eyes. And because my plan had failed, I got punched in the face twice and I'm freaking out. <laughs> and everything's all messed up by a simple smack in the face. But this happens to us very often, right? It doesn't have to be a fighting match. It doesn't have to be, you know, in the ring, but it happens in just regular life. Right? Something big happens, like it feels like we got punched in the face and suddenly all our plans get crumbled. And this is what's happening in our passage today. This is what's happening to Saul, also known as Paul. Right? He begins to realize that God has his eye set on him. And this is how the chapter starts. Right? And, the chapter, and the chapter starts with the word, meanwhile. This is probably one of my favorite words in the English dictionary, and you'll see why. Right? Because meanwhile means that while this is happening, another thing is happening. And when we read this, we read a few chapters ago, we read a few chapters back before we see that the church is going crazy. It's blowing up. It's getting new members and new converts. Right? People are giving their lives to Christ. People are repenting from their sins. And it wasn't just a handful. It was thousands at a time. People were selling their possession, giving it to the needy. It wasn't just Jewish people, but it was non-Jew. We saw in the chapter before, or if you read back in the chapter before, we see an Ethiopian man who runs into Philip, one of the disciples, and he gives his life to Christ. You know, but while all these good things are happening in history, there's also this happening. Right? Meanwhile, Paul was still breathing out, murderous threats. Now, I don't know about you, but every time I read this passage, I think about some Looney Tune cartoon, right? Bugs Bunny. And I see Saul just getting all red up, all red, and steam starts coming out of his ears, and he's hyperven hyperventilating, 
And, uh, and he's about to you know, charge in like a bull as he sees a red cape. You know, he goes into the elders, you know, he goes to the elders of the synagogue and he demands a warrant to go to Damascus with his murderous intentions to bring back the people who fled from Jerusalem. Because at that time, the Christians were being persecuted in Jerusalem. So what? They go to the next city, you know, Damascus, to find refuge. It would be like if a federal agent or an ICE agent raided your home, dragged you out to jail, and put you in trial in front of a judge, only to be automatically found guilty because you believed in Jesus. It would be just like that. But it wasn't just you. It would be your entire family. And they would all receive capital punishment, or most likely death. You know, and Saul slash Paul was the head honcho. He was the shark collar of this raid. So he goes with a group of people to put things back in order, to you know, put back their religion in order. Right? And he comes up with this plan to honor God. But, but Saul is about to get hit by an unstoppable force, and he's about to run into an unmovable object. And here is where it would have been good for Saul to know Mike Tyson. Because Mr. Tyson would have told him, would have told him to him straight. Right? Everyone has a plan until they get hit in the face. And it's no different for us believers too. We all have our own plans until we get hit by God's grace. And that's our central truth today. God's grace is bigger than our plans. Again, our central truth is God's grace is a lot bigger than our plans. And here we see three points that will help us understand the weight of His grace. And we're going to look at this in a boxing class, right? Um, a one-two punch and finally a haymaker. Right? The first punch is Jesus' presence. The second punch is the shock, right? After the first punch, the second punch comes the shock. And lastly, the haymaker, right? The final blow, the final hit. And that is you know, God's grace. So the first punch, the first punch is Jesus' presence. Read with me verses 3 and 4. It reads this. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? I don't know about you guys, but usually the first punch that gets to me, it has the most impact. And the first move, God comes at Saul very simply, very quickly, and he just comes with him as himself. Right? It's just straightforward. Jesus just appears. And that often just changes our plan. Right? When we encounter the living God, when we encounter Jesus for who he really is, we have no other option but to humble ourselves and accept him for who he really is. There is no other option but to change and to transform. And I'm willing to double down on that statement is, you know, encountering Jesus is, is, is abs- absolutely life-changing, right? Encountering Jesus is absolutely life-changing. And we see this throughout history. We see this throughout the gospel. If you read through the gospel, you see that everyone who had encountered Jesus, their lives were radically changed, completely different, we see it in the disciples, right? They were just fishermen, tax collectors, zealots, all these radical people, all these nobodies. And then suddenly, when they meet Jesus, they become these apostles, people who change the history of the world. We see Mary and Martha, right? Just nobodies, but they become such historic figures. Right? We see Zacchaeus, just a little man, right? A cheater, right? Of someone who cheats people out of their money. He meets Jesus radically, radically gives his life to him. And when you see Jesus for who he really is, you have no other options to change. And we see countless more who are willing to lose their life for the sake of the name of Jesus. Right? People are being persecuted. They're like, it's okay. I'm willing to give my life for Jesus. And the question we have to ask is, why would people go through such length? Because later we find out that Paul becomes one of these people. He becomes someone who was, who's willing to suffer for Christ. He's absolutely willing to change the entirety of his life. And there are two reasons why people will go through this lane. And we see the first one in our passage today. You know, our encounter with Jesus changes everything because 
knowing the real Jesus reorients everything in your life. And knowing the real Jesus reorients everything in your life. Everything changes. Right? From the way you view life, from the way you view sin, from the relationship around you, from the way you act, the way you talk, everything changes. Right? I remember the first time you know, I became a Christian, you know, I used to swear like a sailor. Like, you know, so many bad words would just come out of my, my mouth. It's almost embarrassing. But as soon as I met Jesus, that was so disgusting. Right? It, you completely change. The view of sin changes. And another example would be like this, right? It would be like going to a place you never knew. And you're trying to go on your own, you know, memory or your own, you know, logic. Right? And you're driving around place and you're always taking the turns where you want to go, right? Going freely, but you're not going the right way. But when you encounter Jesus, it's like getting a GPS that finally tells you the proper way to go. And in fact, it tells you that you've been going backwards. Right? It's when you get that GPS, you're finally able to go to the right way. You're able to see your life and you, you're able to see the wickedness of yourself and be like, yeah, I've been going the wrong way. I must repent. I must turn. Sin has no more joy, you know, Satan has no more hold on me. Now I'm going to follow God. And I remember talking to one of my students uh, who had a very personal encounter with Jesus at a retreat. And he would say, um, he would say this, right? And he said, everything is now different, right? His life, you know, my life wasn't, wasn't just filled with, you know, what I wanted to do, but I started to see sin in a new light, you know, he, he described it to me like this. It felt like for the first time, God had turned on the lights into my heart and shown me how much of a mess my heart was. But instead of telling me to clean it up, He cleaned it for me. Right? Things I wasn't willing to touch or throw away, He got His hands dirty and threw it away, threw it away for me. Right? That's what it was. Right? That's what it was for Him to encounter Jesus that, like, Suddenly the, the lights go on and he understands what's happening. Because the encounter with Jesus reorients our entire life. It changes our script. It changes our plans that we had for ourselves. Right? And the second reason why I believe it's so life-changing is because it is absolutely personal. Right? Let's read verses 4 and 5. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. And when we read verses 4, we, we read Jesus' reply to Saul, which is, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? But when we read at the beginning of the chapter, we know that Saul isn't going after Jesus. He's going after his believers. He's going after the church. But this here teaches us one very important lesson on how Jesus views the church. That Jesus sees the church as himself. And that's very important because Jesus and this church are one. This is important for us too because Jesus is the head of our church. Now we are his body. To Saul's murderous threat, it wasn't just towards the individual people, but it was to Christ himself. So, you know, so Jesus took it personally. He said, why are you persecuting me? Why are you doing this to me? And I, I had to do some thinking and a lot of thinking. Like, why would Jesus say that? Why would Jesus say that to, to Saul, right? It's not that Saul was going after Jesus. Jesus was, you know, already in heaven. But the reason why he took it personally, why Jesus took it so personally, is because he loves the church. Jesus loves the church. In fact, Jesus loves the church so much, he gave his life for it. He gave his life for you and me. It's like this. If someone goes after something you love dearly, you kind of take it personally. right? You know, it's like, I don't know why, but every time you know my wife says something bad about LA, to be honest, I get a little bit personal, right? Because I love LA. LA is my home. It feels like she's insulting me. 
And, you know, we see this with other things, right? You know, when, when people, you know, hate on our favorite music or hate on our favorite food, we kind of take it personal, or the people that we love. You know, and that's what's happening. Saul went after the church, and it was like going after a baby bear. And mama bear wasn't so happy, right? Jesus took it so personally. And that's the first punch, right? Jesus shows himself, and he shows himself completely. And when he shows himself, it's completely life-changing. Right? And it's life-changing because he invites us into this love. It's not just life-changing because I know it here mentally, but it's life-changing because I know it here and I know how much He loves me. I know how much He cares for me, that He's willing to die on the cross for me. He invites us into His love. That's the first punch, right? The first punch is Jesus shows us Himself and, and invites us into His love. But the second punch is this, right? The second punch is the shock. And I say the shock because, you know, you ex- the first punch, yeah, it takes you off guard, but man, the second punch hurts even more, right? And this is what's happening in verses 8 through 9. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he couldn't see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Right? I call this the shock because... Saul's life is completely upside down at this point. It just took, right? It's just like all of us who has, who has our firm set beliefs. And then when it gets crushed, you know, we fall into shock, right? For Saul, it was being righteous. It was being morally right with God, right? God, I'm doing this for you. You know, I'm persecuting these You know, people for you because God, there's no such thing as a blasphemer. How could they worship Jesus? Right? They're doing, for him, it was to be morally right with God that he's better than the rest. But we're no different either. We're exactly the same. You know, for, for, for Saul, it was his morality that was his savior. And for us, we might be just like him. We might say, only if I was good enough, you know, I will. Only if, I was, if, if I'm good with God, I'll read the Bible. I'll do QT. I'll pray just to be right with God. I'll read the Bible just to be right with God. Some of you guys are willing to do all these things, all the right steps, do discipleship, do leadership, you know, come to praise Him, practice, do all that, but you're not even putting Christ at the center of that. Right? Some of us might be willing to do QT, but not even have the heart to have Jesus at the center of that. You just wanted to do, if I do this, there's another checklist. Maybe God might owe me a favor. Right? But that's no different than looking for a savior. You're still looking for your own efforts to save you. I know some of you guys might be willing to look in a savior by taking control of your own life. Right? Some of you guys might say, well, I'm my own boss. I am the master of my faith. I am the captain of my ship. So you rebel against God's plan and God's will. And you see, there's, you see, both of them are equally the same. You reject God's way of salvation, which is simply to come to Christ. You know, so you come up with your own plans and your own ways. One of them is getting God to owe you, and the other one is to straight up just run away from God. There's no difference. There's no difference. They're, they're both the same. At the end of it, the underlining sin behind that sin is, I want to do it my way, and I don't want to follow your way, God. It's all the same. And and that's what happens in this story where we see Saul being crushed, right? His core belief of of having God owe him a favor is getting crushed. And the best example of this is kind of like this. I remember my time doing working at a suicide prevention call center, and I would get many calls. Right? But one of the most common calls I would get is, you know, I just found out my spouse was cheating on me, you know, or I just lost my job, I just lost something dear to me, or I failed a class, and all of these things are basically getting hit in the face, right? You're like, ah, I got hit in the face, right? Something that is very important to me, the things that I planned, suddenly get crushed and they no longer, I could no longer function. I'm in shock. 
my core beliefs were crushed and my plans were quickly changed. And most of them would say, I don't know what to do. Most of them would say, I feel so lost. I feel so broken. I feel so blind. And here we see a very similar thing happening with Saul. His, his, whole, his own life, his whole life of being a Pharisee, right? And the things he most identified himself with of being a vessel of God's work is completely being crashed down as he realizes that what he was doing is exactly opposite. The first thing we see is someone leading the charge to persecute Christians. But now we see that someone is being led into Damascus. He needed help navigating his blindness. His GPS failed him. Basically, he was just running around with a broken compass. No purpose. Utterly shot. Right? And most of you guys might know how that feels. Right? When your GPS is broken, when your life plan suddenly tells you detour, detour, redirect, redirect. Or some of you guys might be walking around with a broken compass. It doesn't even point north anymore. So you're just wandering around in circles. And there's nothing more frustrating than a broken compass. You know, there's nothing more frustrating than being directionless. Directionless right, when our plans suddenly have to come to a stop. You, know, you might have had plans for your careers or may have plans for your future family or until you broke up or for future education until something had to stop. And right now, you might be in a season of blindness where your plans no longer are in the equation and you don't know what to do. You know, some of you might feel lost. Some of you might feel blind. But here's a few things that we see. And here are some ways that we can navigate through the shock of blindness. Right? First, the first way to navigate through the blindness or through the shock is is what we see is that Saul wasn't alone. Right? When we read is after he got up, we had the people around him had to lead him. Right? When we read the scriptures, it says, you know, when he when we get hit in the face by God's grace, we we need people around us to lead us and help us. Up. Right? These people might not have right. These people around Saul might have not known the solution. They might not even know what's going on. They just you know. S- they, they were just, they might have been just as confused as Saul, but they were there to help him and lead him by the hand because he was completely humbled and dependent on other people. I don't know about you guys, and I don't know if you guys ever worked with the blind, but I remember when I used to work at a developmental you know, center, there was a patient who was blind and you know, he, and I was, you know, his caretaker at that time. And he couldn't do nothing until I got there. Right? He needed me to put my arm or put his hand around my arm so I could lead him to the bathroom or to the sofa or to wherever he wanted to go. Because being blind, right, is a sign of being completely humbled and completely dependent. And some of you guys might not even notice that. You might be blind, but your pride is so up there. You're saying, I don't need a a guide. I don't need help. But the reality is, if you are blind, if you're having a hard time to see the way, then you just need someone to guide you. But the second thing thing to navigate our blindness and our shock is is found in verse 9. For three days he was blind. He did not eat or drink anything. And this is a strange verse for me, a little bit. Because, you see, blindness came involuntarily, right? He was blind because Jesus made him blind. But eating and not drinking was voluntary. He chose not to eat. He chose not to drink. Right? The Bible didn't say God took his ability to eat, right? It didn't say that, right? But what we know what happened is he chose not to eat and not to drink because he was praying and he was thinking. And this, that's the second way to navigate through the blindness and the shock is for us to pray and to think. Right? 
ultimately what he was doing, he was fasting. He was trying to find out the answer of who Jesus really was and what God's will was for him in his life. Right? And it, in our time of blindness, we are forced to pray and we are forced to think. Right? We are forced to wrestle with our doubts and our frustration. And this is what we see in verse 11, as we jump a little bit forward. Uh, the Lord told him, Ananias, right, go to the house of Judah on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And I love this verse because it shows us that Saul was praying, but, most li- but mostly it shows us that God was listening to Saul's prayer. He was listening to Saul's desperate prayer when he was in his most desperate, broken place. Right? That in this time of blindness, God was listening to him. God was recalibrating, reorienting his heart and his will. And this is what I think what Saul was thinking. The entire time, Right? If I was in the perspective of Saul, I would be like, man, this entire time, I believed I was honoring God by chasing away Christians, by persecuting them, calling them blasphemers. But I just saw Jesus. Right? The same Jesus I was on the cross. And this is important for Saul because he, for Saul, there was no way that Jesus could have been the Messiah. Why? Because he was hung on a cross. Right? And for Saul, who was the master of scripture, when he saw Jesus hung on the cross, he immediately thought Deuteronomy 21-23, for a man hung on a cross is cursed by God. For a man who's hung on a cross is cursed by God. Saul would think that the Messiah, right? Saul was probably thinking, man, the Messiah is supposed to bring blessing. He was supposed to be a blessing, not be a curse. Right? This makes no sense unless unless he hung there not for his curse, but for mine. Right? That's what's going on in Saul's mind. And this is why he was praying. He was processing who Jesus really was. Right? There's no way. There's no way that Jesus is cursed. I just saw him alive. He must be blessed. He wasn't hanging there for his sins. He was hanging there for mine. And it was during the most senselessness, in this most senseless time, he was able to get his eyes fixed through the lens of, through the lens of grace. Right? It was through his most blindest time he was able to get his eyes fixed through the lens of grace. And we go to our third way of navigating through the blindness, which is this. Right? God will always work in the meanwhile. God will always work in the meanwhile. And while Saul was still blind, God didn't just leave him blind. He didn't say, like, don't worry, you'll get your sight back in three days, you know, just chill for a bit. No, what God does, he goes to Ananias, right? He goes to Ananias and tells him to restore his sight, right? Verses 10 to 12 says this. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias, right? Not the same Ananias that, you know, stole from the church, but this is a different Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask him for a man named Tarsus, named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come to come and place his hand on him to restore his sight. Right? And this is a very important character study, you know, to to really observe because Ananias also had plans. He also had a script. He also knew that who Saul of Tarsus was because he says in verse thirteen to fifteen. You know, Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. 
See, God works in the meanwhile. While we're only focused on the present, God works in the meanwhile. While we feel like we're stuck in blindness, God is figuring out a way for us to be out of that blindness. He works beyond what we could see. And He gives us His will and purpose, right? Even if ours collapse before Him. He gives us a greater plan. God will never leave us in the blindness when we are willing to go before Him. He will never leave us hanging low and dry when we are calling after His name. He longs for us to be a part of His plan. He longs for us to be with Him, to be there in His presence and His will. That is His will. And this is where we come to our haymaker of our sermon today, the final punch. The final punch. God gives us His grace. Right? God gives us His grace. Let's read verse 17 to 19. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hand on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. We see here that it was Jesus who appeared before Ananias. And what does Ananias say? God sent me to you. Right? God sent me to you so that you can see and you could be filled with the Holy Spirit. And as soon as he accepts, the first thing he does, he gets baptized. Right? Right? I don't know about you, right? But if I was blind for a period of time, the first thing I want to look at is probably the most beautiful thing, or you know, which is my wife, if you're there listening, right? Or it would be the skies or some trees, right? Something beautiful. Right? But the first thing I wouldn't do would be baptized because, right? It just doesn't make sense, right? The reason why Paul decided to get baptized is because he was thinking and he knew that it was Jesus who was the Messiah. Right? He makes a public, you know, he makes it a priority to make a public declaration that he is a follower of Jesus, right? Because that's what baptism is. He repents away from his sins and he follows Christ. Because the biggest impact that we can receive from God is himself. is to accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Right? Because it's to accept that Jesus gave himself for us in our darkest time. But didn't leave us alone but sent us the Holy Spirit. You know, isn't that the entire story of humanity? Right? Starting from you know, the Garden of Eden, God wants us to dwell. God wants to dwell with us, but, he, but mankind chooses themselves. They choose to be God, so they reject God. So God says, no, we're going to make this happen. And so he, makes, so he goes to Moses and says, hey, you know, here's a law, but they still choose to disobey. Right? God says, if you obey the law, I will deal with you, but the Israelites choose to disobey. You know, and this is continuously God's plan for humanity, for us. Hey, if you come to receive me just as I am, I will dwell with you. Right? God's plan is called grace. Right? It's when He gives Himself as a gift. Right? That is God's plan. That is God's plan for salvation. Right? As He took up the cross and suffered for us, he fills us with the Holy Spirit. He gives Himself to us. Right? That is what grace is. That is the gift. God Himself is the gift. And, and you know, it's not until we receive His grace or receive Jesus, we would not until we receive Him, our scales of our eyes would never fall off. Not until we receive Him. Not until we, we accept that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Our eyes will never fall. Or the scales in our eyes will never fall off. Some of you might be just so attached to your ways. 
Some of you might be so attached to your plans. Some of you might be so attached to sin that have blinded you from God's way and God's plans for salvation. Right. And I'm going to say this, turn on the GPS. Right. Turn on God's plans for salvation. Right. Turn it on. Right. Let grace consume you. Let His plan lead you to repentance and ultimately lead you to having more of who God is. You know, my wife nags at me all the time when I don't follow the GPS. You know, I'm pretty sure that God does the same thing when we don't follow His plan for salvation. I bet God is saying, what are you doing? I'm just trying to pour out my love for you. Why are you going the other way? This, you know, God is saying, why would you do this? You know, I'm giving you clear instructions. Listen to me. Receive me. But we, blinded with the scales in our eyes, blinded by sin and our pride and our arrogance, choose not to. Choose not to. You know, some of us here might not be even, might be so discouraged, might be in so much in shock, right, that things didn't go your way. You know, some of you might have had some spiritual high, then reality came, hit you in the face, and you're like, I don't even know what it means to be a Christian anymore. Then I'm going to say this very simply to you, church. Go and lean on God's grace. Remember that God's grace is God giving himself to you. He's becoming very present. Right? You know, and the best example is this. Right? The best example I could give you is this. You know, what does it mean that God gives himself to you? Is that he puts away everything just to be present before you. God of the universe. Right? He is the only one who's able and capable of setting aside anything and tending to you and our brokenness. Right? Sometimes, church, we need to be hit by God's grace. Right? We need to be in shock of God's grace. Right? Because it gets us to think, it gets us to sit down and be like, man, maybe I had the wrong view of a Savior. Maybe I didn't really understand who Jesus was. So at this time, I want to invite you into a place right, of prayer and say, God, you know, I just want more of your grace. I want to know what your grace feels like. I don't care if I'm hit, it, hit by it a million times. I want to understand what it means to be hit, to, full, to understand the fullness of your grace. You know, God is rich in grace and mercy, and He's willing to pour it out for us. But first, we must be in a place to ask. So before we close, church, I want to invite you to a place where you could just simply ask for His grace. Will you join me in prayer? Sing together. He is jealous for me. Not like a hurricane, and I am a tree. Bending baby, the weight of his wind and mercy. But all of a sudden,
Sing it again. He is jealous for me. He is jealous for me. Love like a hurricane. I am a tree. Bing, bing, bing. The weight of his wind and mercy. And all of a sudden, I am a Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for this opportunity we have to listen to your word that even though when we think that we know best, God, you are so gentle that you call us by our names with such such love to invite us back into your presence, to invite us back into you know your community, your body, to be one with you. You say, come. Let me show you more of myself. And you extend that grace to us. You extend that gift for us. Oh Lord, at this time, I pray that our community, our LAOC community, will come and sit down and understand the fullness of your grace, the fullness of your beauty, for the fullness of who you are as you give yourself to us, as you give yourself to us on the cross and you fill us up with the Holy Spirit, Lord, all these things, Lord, that is the definition of grace and may we come and run to it every time. Lord, that we may have more of you, that we may crave for you, that we may long for you more than we, more than the air we breathe, Lord, because the way you love us, God, is beyond anything that we could ever fathom. So God, Please, we ask, Lord, as you come and dwell, Lord, throughout our weeks, may we see more of your grace. Lord, thank you so much. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Um, Church, um, just thank you for this time and joining us in our corporate worship. Um, I pray that you guys will encounter the grace of God fully and just be immersed in his love. Yeah, God gave himself for us, and that's the gift that we, we have to truly just 
enjoy is God Himself. So I pray that you guys go in peace and uh, have a beautiful day. Bye. To God and to the Lamb I will sing, I will sing. To God and to the Lamb I will sing. To God and to the